Welcome to Bangor Harvest Church, a church with a big heart and a big vision. Romans chapter 1. We are going to look at two verses. You will be quite surprised today as we studied these two verses that uh, Sunday morning service, one service is just not sufficient for us to study these two verses. But let's read that verse and then from there we go on um, from there. Okay, Romans chapter 1, we're going to read from verse 15 through 17. Let's read together loudly, boldly, and let's read the word of God together. The count of three, one, two, and three. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jews, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous shall live, will live by faith. So this morning we are going to spend our time today to study what Paul has begun to speak here. Now, if Paul's letter to the Romans is a summary of the gospel in the entire Bible, I kept telling you the book of Romans is a book that can tell you what true gospel is. The book of Romans is a book that can tell you what full gospel is. Today we have used the word gospel so many times, but we have not understood the word gospel. I keep telling people, gospel is not that just Jesus loves you. Gospel is not that Jesus cares for you. Gospel contains the love of Jesus. Gospel contains the care of Jesus. But the gospel itself is not that Jesus loves you. For years now, for years now, we have been, been stuck with the understanding of the gospel as Jesus loves you. And that's why when you tell an unbeliever Jesus loves you, he looks at you and asks you a question. If your Jesus loves me so much, why all this trouble is in the world? What is the answer you're going to give to him? You know what you just did? You took some pearls and threw it among swines. What does the swine do when they find pearls? Oh, got some pearl. They're going to take and make a nice necklace and wear it around their neck. No, they're going to trample on it. You take the love of God and give to somebody who doesn't even know what God's love is. And they never understand the gospel. So that's why this study is going to help this church this morning. And those who are listening to this audio recordings through video or audio, give them the understanding and the opportunity to understand what gospel is. Amen. Somebody say gospel. So today we're going to go on to these three verses. So that if this book of Romans is a summary of the gospel to the whole Bible, then these two verses that we're going to study this morning are the summary to Paul's letter to the Romans. These two verses, verse 16 and 17, these two verses is a summary of the whole book of Romans. These two verses are the theme of the entire letter, the text for his sermon. Everything else is an explanation of these two verses. Which means if you understand these two verses, you can pretty much be prepared to face the book of Romans. You will be more, more be able to benefit from the teaching of the book of Romans if you understand these two verses. So today I want you to warn you before we get into these two verses. We are going deep. Turn to neighbors and tell them we are going deep into the word of God. Amen? It's no more uh, milk. It is meat now. We are not giving milk for babies. You are enough of drinking milk. Nah, 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 nah. Time to really attack. What? Real food. It's a solid meat. So that's what we're getting into this morning. Every word in these two verses counts. So we're going to pay attention to every word. Nobody is in a rush to finish these two verses on one Sunday. So it's okay if we don't finish the whole thing on this Sunday. We can always take it to the next Sunday. Amen. But pay attention and learn here with your hearts. 
open to the word of God so that the spirit of the Lord can speak to us this morning. Amen. Turn to your neighbors and tell them, keep your hearts open so that the Lord can speak to us. Amen. So in order for us to understand these verses, first we need to understand the terminologies that are used in these verses. The first word I'd like to, uh, to bring to your no notice and your focus is the word for. Nearly about three times the word for comes. And this word for is for the word because. These verses are statements that continues the previous statements. Because of that, this. Because of this, that. You can't just come and say because for, and just give a statement without telling because of what. You are with me this morning? Yes, I told you. We are getting deep. So if you don't pay attention, everything is going to fly above your head today. Let me help you understand verse 15 this way. Paul is saying, see, right in verse 15 itself, he says, that is why. So that is why I'm eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Why? Because I am not ashamed. Why Paul is not ashamed? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Why is it the power of God? Because it is the righteousness of God that is revealed. So the word you need to understand here is because. So there are Four things that Paul is mentioning here, which we're going to take time to study this week and next week, and the Lord will give us the grace for that. The first thing that we're going to look into is the gospel of God. Somebody say the gospel of God. <clears throat> because that's what Paul says even in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. We are preaching all kinds of gospel today. There is something called a grace gospel. There's something called a wealth gospel. There's something called whatever gospel. But what are we supposed to be focusing on? We need to focus on the gospel of God. So that's the first thing that we're going to look at. The gospel of God. That's the first thing Paul is mentioning here. The second thing Paul is mentioning here is the power of God. Somebody say the power of God. We're going to understand that a little more by the end of today's service. What do we mean by the word power? Power is associated with so many things today. Third thing that we're going to see that which Paul mentions here is the righteousness of God. Somebody say the righteousness of God. The fourth thing we're going to see what Paul mentions here is the word of God. Somebody say the word of God. So these are going to be our main focus today and next Sunday. And I believe God will help us to understand. Come on, let's uh, focus on the first thing that Paul mentions. That is the gospel of God. Now again, the meaning of the word gospel. I would like to take you a little more deeper than I've given to you so far. The word and the meaning of the word gospel. It comes from an old Saxon word, spell. S-P-E-L or S-P-E-L-L. -L. Spell, which means story. So the word gospel originally was God's spell, which means God's story. Translated from a Greek word, which is evangelical. But it is always spelled in the early days with E-U. And it is sometimes pronounced as Evangelion or Evangelion. E-U-A-N-G-E-L-I-O-N. Which means good news proclaimed to someone. A story of something that has happened. That is wonderfully received by the people to whom you tell it. When a battle was won, they would come with a evangelion, which is evangel 
which is good news. To say, now we have overcome the battle. We are no more slaves of this nation anymore. That is good news. Evangel. Evangelion. So when Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, what he means is not, I am not ashamed of God's story. He's saying, I'm not ashamed of God's story. Paul is saying, I have a thrilling announcement to make. I have a great story to tell you. And that is what is called the gospel of God. Many think when Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he was trying to say, if I'm not ashamed of it, I am proud of it. No, that's not what Paul means. When you say, I'm not ashamed of something, that means you're proud of something, right? Paul is not trying to say, I am proud of the gospel. Instead, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. See, all these depths, is going to give us the platform. Sometimes you might wonder, do I need to go this deep in order to get the understanding of the word? If you don't go this deep, you would not get the understanding this deep. So what Paul did not mean was, he didn't mean, I'm proud. Even though it is something to be proud to announce, gospel is something that you are proud to announce, Jesus can set you free from the power of sin. But Paul doesn't mean, when, I'm, when he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he doesn't mean that I'm proud of the gospel. That's not what he, he means here. Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because many were ashamed of the gospel. You might have a simple question this morning. Why would someone be ashamed of the gospel? Then I have a question for you. If you're not ashamed of the gospel, why haven't you shared the gospel? You with me? Oh, you might say, oh yes, pastor. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Good brother, good sister. Then why you never shared the gospel? Why would someone be ashamed of the gospel? I'll give you a few points on that. Our gospel is about a baby born in a manger who is a son of God. When you tell the world this, they laugh at it. <laughs> Baby born in a manger. Who is he? Son of God. <laughs> For whom you're telling your story. So we are sometimes ashamed to share the gospel because it's about a king who was born as a baby in a manger. We are sometimes ashamed, ashamed to say, uh, share the gospel because our gospel is about the supernatural person who took the five loaves of bread and two fish and fed how many people? 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, which could easily be 15,000 people there. He took five loaves of bread and two fish and he fed. It's a supernatural thing. But that does not give you a scientific explanation. So when you go to the, uh, the highly educated people, sometimes we are ashamed to share with them the supernatural power of God. Why we are unable to explain five loaves and two fish into 15,000 people plus 12 baskets remaining. They'll look at you and say, boss, what you're saying scientifically cannot be. As simple as this, they will say to you, tell you, if your Jesus did it, do it for me. Come on, church, do it for me. I know many of you had these kind of challenges, and that's why you stopped sharing gospel. That's why you started to become ashamed of the gospel. Another reason why we are ashamed of the gospel. Our gospel is about a person who was killed as a criminal and his death brings salvation to the whole world. The world says, yeah, but they killed him, right? He died, right? He said, yeah, but he rose up on the third day. No, but he died, right?
He didn't overcome that criminal charges. He didn't overcome that battle against Pilate. He didn't stand against those who nailed his hands. If he was truly the son of God, just like this, the soldier who came to Jesus on the cross, he said, by the cross, he said, if you're truly the son of God, why don't you save yourself and save us? We are ashamed to share the gospel because this gospel is about a person who was killed as a criminal. And by his death, he saved the entire world. You don't find it very convincing truth to share the gospel. Another reason why we are ashamed to share the gospel is our gospel is about what happened 2,000 years ago. And it sounds very irrelevant to today's people. Hey, what are you talking about? Nonsense. Are you, come on. You educated? Don't tell me you read the Bible and you believe it. You come put your head. 2,000 years ago, he lived. This man, Jesus, he died. He went. Now, why are you holding on to that book after 2,000 years? Be, be modern. Does your Bible have mobile phone? No. See, we are in modern world. Does your Bible have laptop? You have any verses that says laptop? No. Does your my Bible have iPhone, iPad? Does your Bible have mention of cars, bikes, modern technologies, television? Be relevant to today's time, man. Don't be so foolish. I know some of, uh, some of your bosses have put you down this way. So that's why we are ashamed to share the gospel. Another reason why we are ashamed to share the gospel is our gospel is about an insignificant group of people who live all around the world, who are widely divided among themselves, very few who really take Christian life and Christian living seriously. Simple. You go share the gospel. I said, telling me about Jesus. There's this guy, a Christian only in our office. Never comes on time to work. This fellow, no. He's also Christian. You tell him one work to do. I pay him salary for dando. I'm paying salary for him in vain. This girl, no. Hopeless worker in my office. I'm just keeping because if I say anything, she'll start. Hello? Pastor, you're prophesying about me. I pray today the Lord will change you. So we are ashamed to share the gospel because the Christians have not maintained the testimony. The moment you talk about Christ, they say, hey, if your Christ is one person, why are there so many divisions in Christianity, man? Why is there so many den denominations? Lutherans are there, Baptists are there, Roman Catholics are there, some pray to Mary, some pray to Sari, some pray to me. We are not able to answer such questions. And because of that, we are ashamed. And some people say, look, Islam came many hundred years after Christianity came. But Muslims are more than Christians today. You are still minority now. If you are Christ, your God is true God. Why are all still minority people, man? So we always feel so intimidated inside of ourselves. We always think, okay, just because not many are Christians, we are not in a position to share the gospel. So we are ashamed of the gospel. Our gospel is insulting because it looks at a finest man and says, you are lost. It looks at a finest man and says, you are a sinner. You're damned unless you believe in what I tell you. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you shall be insulting. A man who is fine, looks like everything is figured out. He's like at the top of the organizational ladder. He's got wealth. He's got education. He's got power. He has employed you or he's whatever in the society. You go and tell him, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He looks at you like, are you crazy? 
What? Why should I repent? I am fine. I have everything I need. You drive a BMW? No, I do. Do you live in this million house? No, I do. So they tried to put across words and make us look like we are nothing. But that's why many of us, most of the time, we are ashamed of the gospel. Now Paul says in his first sentence in verse 16, can you say those verses to that those words together with me, church? One, two, and three. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because he's saying in the previous verses, Paul is trying to say, you know, I'm very eager to come to you. I've been planning to come to you because there is, there is a situation here which I will tell you what these people in Rome were saying. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is even said that the church in Rome said, why is Paul not preaching his gospel here? Why is Paul not coming and visiting Rome? He has done three missionary journeys. He has gone to every place. Why hasn't he not come to Rome? Maybe he's ashamed. He's ashamed to preach to us. Paul is saying, no, I am not ashamed. Now, now, can you get the understanding of that verse, church? He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is possible that you and I are ashamed of the gospel. Because when you are ashamed about the gospel, then you are reluctant to preach the gospel. If you are not reluctant to preach, if you are not reluctant, then you are eager. Now, Paul is saying, I am eager to come to you. Why? I am not ashamed. See, when you are eager, you are not ashamed. When you are reluctant, uh, why to simply bell the cat? Why to simply talk nonsense here? No, we came to work. Let me just shut my mouth, finish my work and go. Good. At least maintain your testimony that your work will contain the gospel. I'm not saying go and blabber. I'm saying let's live the gospel. I think it was Charles Spurgeon, I believe, who said, always preach the gospel. Use words if necessary. Turn to your neighbor and say these words. Always preach the gospel. Use words. If necessary. Which means with my life, I can preach the gospel. With my work, I can preach the gospel. With my friendship with people, I can preach the gospel. With my help for other people, I can preach the gospel. You don't need to even have to speak one word about Jesus, but your life can testify that you belong to Jesus. If you are eager to preach the gospel, then you are not ashamed of the gospel. But if you are reluctant to preach, then you are ashamed of the gospel. When God puts you in a place for a purpose, never be ashamed to call yourself as a child of God. Wherever you go. Oh, I'm in business, pastor. I'm also in business. Wherever I go, one of the first thing I say, I'm a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I fear God more than I fear man. I'm never ashamed. That puts me in a more challenging spot to stand up to my testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the mercies of God, the Lord has never let me down. Today, I want to challenge you to stand up for the Lord. Today, I want to challenge you to live a life of testimony that people can see you and ask, are you a Christian? We talk so much and we live so little. We brag so much and we bring very little. 
That's why Christianity does not have the worth and the value it should have in our world today. That's why Christianity has not affected the world. It should have affected the way it should. Last night I was quite amazed at one of the testimonies from China, from Wuhan. When people are just sick and facing death on one side, the underground church people, pastors have risen they go on the streets distributing free masks because people stand in queue for 8 to 10 hours to buy one mask to cover their face. Have you ever thanked the Lord for the air you are able to freely breathe this morning? Did anybody come here wearing masks and full gear on your head? Anybody come here? No. How freely we are breathing the air. But in China, it's not that state. No, it's not the state. Same state. For nearly 8 to 10 hours, people stand in a queue to buy one mask to cover their face so that they could breathe and not be infected. I don't know how much you know about what's happening in China. One of the latest informations that has come, which was discussed in the White House in the United States of America, says there are nearly 1.6 million people who are affected with this coronavirus, which makes it 16 lakh people. Whatever news you get here, on the newspaper, is all a lie. The death toll of people who are dead are in thousands, not 800 people. The whole media has been lying to us about the situation. But the truth is there far beyond you and I can think. A few weeks ago, I was reading the news and one of the Jewish uh, scientists have even proved or even is willing to prove that this virus could have been spread not by any bats or eating any s snakes. This virus could have been spread, possibly is able to, willing to take a test and, you know, prove it that it was a biological warfare, weapon that they were manufacturing for Third World War and it backfired them like a nuclear weapon, it's backfired them. And this morning, you know, I don't know, around 3 o'clock, I just woke up from sleep, and I couldn't sleep again after that. So I decided I'll just get up and just start preparing for today's message. And I just checked my message. One of my friends had sent a message about the, the news in China. You know, it, the, the images were so disturbing. My spirit was just so low, I just had to be in the presence of God and ask God to give me the strength. Because you see people there, houses are sealed with people inside. Police are going and sealing the door. Can you imagine your house door sealed? You cannot come out of your house. Why? You got coronavirus. What if we die? They say you will die inside. Because if you die outside, others will be affected. This is the state of this nation. People are just fallen everywhere. Has any news channel showed those images? Never. But all this you need to understand. God is still in. Because China thought it is the most wealthiest nation, the most uh, powerful nation. It's got the power, the technology and everything. Today with all the technology and power, could they bring back the dead people back to life? This is where human beings need to understand there is a God above us. We need to fear God and not fear man, science and technology. Times like this, God helps us, our eyes and our understanding to open and see what is happening in the real world. Seek God while he might be found. Seek his presence, seek his face. Pray more, church. Read the word of God more. Even last Sunday, I've been sharing with you, study the word of God every single day. Pray every single day. Let there not be a day that will pass in your life where you have not spent your time in the presence of God. Because there will be a shaking. China is shaken. I'm telling you, India will be shaken also. There will come a day, every country in the world will be shaken. And the Bible says, heaven and earth will be Shaken. What will remain? Only the kingdom of God will remain. Everything else will fail. Everything else will fall. Turn to your neighbors and tell them, stay close to Jesus. So if you're eager to preach the gospel, then you are not ashamed of the gospel. 
But if you're reluctant to preach, then you're ashamed of the gospel. Why is Paul not ashamed of the gospel? Because it is the power of God. Somebody say power of God. Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who has faith. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Which means if you don't believe, you are not saved. Without faith, there is no salvation. Don't try to earn salvation by good deeds. You are never going to be able to earn salvation by good deeds. You can't give 100 crores to a church and get salvation. That's not possible. Just have faith in God. Just receive Him in your heart. Believe with all your heart. Be baptized. Become His child. That is where you walk into the power of God. See, Romans worshipped power. They worship the God of power. We still talk about the Roman might. Paul says, I've got a power that you don't have. That's why when he's speaking to the church in Rome, he's saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power. When you say power in Rome, there is no other power except the Roman power. That's why the gods were gods of power. Power, they worship power literally. You know what, church? Everyone will be ashamed of weakness. No one will be ashamed of power. Say there's a weakness. You're not going to go around telling, you know, this is my weakness. You know what? Uh, I've got this problem. This is a weakness I have. I can't stand for too long. This, you know, this, this lock will just unlock. I'll just keep falling down. You know, I'm so happy about this great weakness. Anybody going around telling about your weakness? Everyone will be ashamed of their weakness. No one will be ashamed of power. Say, for instance, you bought this bike. The most powerful bike. One of the most powerful bikes. Will you buy the bike and just keep it at home and like, don't tell anybody. I've got this bike. It's the most powerful bike. You know, I'm really ashamed to show this bike to my friends. Will you do that? I'm telling you, unnecessarily, you'll be on the road. Everybody has to say... What bike? <laughs> what about cars? You bought the most powerful car, one of the most powerful car. And you are so amazed about this car, but you know what? This is power, and I'm ashamed of having a Dugati parked in my garage. You know, I don't want to drive it because I'm really ashamed. Do do you understand what I'm trying to say? Does it make any sense? Nobody will be ashamed of power. That's why Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You know why? Because it is the power of God. Are you getting something this morning? We are are going gradual. We are going step by step. But but I'm telling you, in these next two Sundays, these two verses will come alive in your life. You would understand. May the Spirit of the Lord open your hearts to let you understand what this gospel is. And let the Spirit of the Lord open your heart to help you understand the power of the gospel. No one will ever be ashamed of power. Say for instance, your father becomes the chief minister of Karnataka. God forbid. Will you be ashamed? Oh, no, I have a, you know, I'm really ashamed. By, uh, yeah, what, what, I, I'm really ashamed to tell you. But no, I don't know how to tell you. I'm really feeling bad to tell you. Tell man. 
and my father is the chief minister of karnataka yeah. even before he is elected as chief minister he also will not behave like that you will behave like the chief minister police commissioner hey nan appu yaar gotta police commissioner will come you stand in before hey ene salute odita alva not honoring respecting me ah nan tande yaar gotta nowadays that and all doesn't work commissioner will come and give one karak hey nin appu karkon bar hogale never when this power we want a little money come in the account our work changes little 20 gram bracelet comes this hand only too much talking <laughs> two sovereign ring comes this hand only too much talking one 10 gram chain comes always scratching the neck one 10000 rupees discount you buy one shoes always keeping the shoe in the front like this shaking the shoes when you have power you are not ashamed psalm 62 verse 11 and 12 the psalmist says one thing god has spoken two things i have heard power belongs to you god and loving devotion to you o lord for you will repay arch men according to his deeds power belongs to who turn to your neighbors and tell them power belongs to god every power that man possesses today in this world is from god no matter what power he holds power to build power to destroy power to invent power to cure power to heal power to do whatever he wants to do every power that man possesses on the face of this earth is from god because from god is all the power and as god gives man power he cannot become powerful he can bring the powerful to nothing overnight we know in our own nation we had a man who had one of the five star airlines who's traveling by bus in london nobody is there to bother him god can turn a man's fate his future overnight because every power comes from god church can i tell you this morning there is nothing equivalent or above the power of god so if you understand the power of god you will never fear man you will never fear any powers in this world the way you will fear the power of god and Jesus was about to be crucified when he stands before Pilate John chapter 19 verse 10 and verse 11 Pilate says do you refuse to speak to me Pilate said don't you realize i have the power either to free you or to crucify you these are the statements of Pilate to Jesus Verse 11 Jesus answered You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above We need to understand when people come with their power and authority to destroy the church God has allowed them to do it let them do it We just need to surrender to God We don't need to retaliate power we just need to surrender to god and let the lord reign over our life to understand that he is in control over every situation he is in control he is a sovereign lord he is in control over everything he is in control over the climate he is in control over the the nature he is in control over everything the onion price going up 
God is in control over that also. Paul says the power of God is packed in the gospel. The word power comes from the Greek word dunamis, from where you get the word dynamite. The gospel is a dynamite. It's a dynamite. It's an explosive power. It can transform a situation right side up, upside down. That is the power of gospel. Are, are we seeing this kind of effect in today's gospel? No. Why? We have not understood what gospel is. Who is going to evangelistic meetings? The same old believers. Who is running for healing meetings? The same old believers. Because we have not understood the power of God. We have not understood the power in the gospel of God. And that's what Paul is trying to help us to understand through the book of Romans. That this gospel of God is not an ordinary news. It is a dynamite. It is the power of God. Unto salvation. Everything we have today called as power or powerful is what man has discovered. Oh, most powerful gun. Most powerful weapon, man. Today we sit and brag about those powerful things. Most powerful mobile phone. Most powerful computer. Most powerful car. Most powerful uh, uh, machinery. Most powerful this. Most powerful light. Most powerful sound. Most powerful this. Who invented all this? All this was invented by man. The true power is what God has created. The gospel which contains the power of God. When a gospel is truly preached and truly believed, a power comes into a person's life and do things in him or in her that nothing else can do. This is gospel. That's when you see the strongest man cry. The weakest man st stand. The poorest man give. That is the power of gospel. Contains the power of God. Today I don't understand why people who are going after the supernatural things are talking about the power of God and they have diluted the power of God. Oh, you want to see the power of God? What? Just fall. That's all. Is the power of God is all for you to just fall? The power of God is for you to stand. It's not a public spectacle for somebody to say, I've got the power of God and draw a line on the stage. You cannot pass from this side to that side. Why? The power of God is with me. People are just playing with the words. But the power of God is more than enough to transform a person. That's what Paul is trying to tell us this morning. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation. To everyone who believes. So with the power. What can I do? It is a power of God. For salvation. A sinner can be saved through the power of God. Not through clever preaching. Let us not think. You know, if he comes and preaches, then people will get saved. If she comes and preaches, people will come and say, no, the, the gospel is not in the person. Of course, it comes to the person, Jesus Christ. But it's not just one person preaching and only then people's eyes are open. Oh, if only he preaches in our church, so many people will be saved. No, if you share, people will still come to salvation. Why? It is the power of God unto salvation. You first don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. Stand bold, stand strong, stand tall in faith. 
You know, no other power in the world can do this for you. This morning, we are going to celebrate the power of God. Because there, there are so many powers in this world. There's a power of politics which cannot do this for you. Power of politics is so corrupt. To an extent, you can't think about politics without corruption. Some of the most the strongest and the most honest nations in the world's politics also have become corrupt. The power of politics can't do it. The power of science can't do it. With the power of science, you cannot bring salvation to anybody. Through the power of politics, you cannot bring salvation to somebody. The power of education, you cannot bring salvation to somebody. The power of God is not revealed through education. You can have 10 degrees in theology. I have four certificates sitting at home from my theological graduation, which did not bring the salvation into my heart, into my life, except Jesus Christ. That's why I am not ashamed. Wherever I stand, wherever I go, I'm not ashamed of who I am in Christ Jesus. Even if the whole world hates me, I don't care about it. Because it's not education that brought me salvation. It's the power of God. You know, salvation has brought education to so many places. I was talking to a wonderful servant of God who served in Bihar, Augustine Jabakumaraya. He was telling in Bihar when they started ministry, the literacy was 2%. But after their ministry started, they have more than 100 schools. It has already crossed more than 30% the last time I spoke to him. I think if I remember correctly, he said it has already crossed 33% Literacy has increased, which means very less illiterates. Because salvation that came to Bihar through one man's obedience to the power of this gospel brought education. You are running after education, not after salvation. Run after salvation, you will have education. Some of your parents, I don't know what is happening to you. You are willing to skip your children going to church and send them for tuitions. What happened to you all? What happened to you all? Salvation is what brings everything into our life. Why would somebody want to skip God? Why would somebody want to skip time in the presence of God and run after things which are not going to be eternal? We need education. We need good grades. We need all the distinctions. As the Sunday morning between 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock, your child is going to study that two hours and become rank holder in the state. I'm telling you today, that two hours only what he learns, we will not remember. Because that is the time he's supposed to give to God. I've seen many people who gave their heart and soul to studying. Just before exam, they can forget everything. Even at that state, who comes to help you? God comes to help you. Just imagine you skip church, you skip everything, you study, study, study. Exam hall, you go and like, hey, hey, I don't know how to even write my name. I forgot everything. What happened to all your studying? I'm not saying if you come to church, you'll get distinction. I'm saying if you come to church, God will help you to study well. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The power of wealth will not save you. No matter how much money you have, you come to church in BMW, AMW, CMW, Benz, Bugatti, Gujarati.
you come in anything the power of salvation is not in your wealth doesn't matter how many buildings you have how many hospitals you own how many universities you own how many houses you have rented how many houses you have how much a bank balance you have how many kilos of gold you have the power of wealth will not bring salvation the power of god which is the gospel can do it and that's why paul says that is why i am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in rome for i am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of god that brings salvation to every one who believes first to the jews then to the gentile shall we all rise on our feet church your grace has found me just as i am empty handed but alive in your hands your grace has found me just as i am empty handed but alive in your hand we sing in majesty of your majesty let's lift it up majesty majesty forever i am changed by your love in the presence of your majesty 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 king of glory majesty forever forever i am changed by your love in the presence of your majesty 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 king of glory majesty empty handed forever i am changed by your love in the presence of Forever I am changed by your love In the presence of your majesty Majesty Knowing that God is in control Can you begin to surrender your worries surrender all your cares to him this morning church And say Lord I'm not going to carry this anymore Now I understand who is powerful. You are powerful. You are powerful above everything else. I will trust in you with all my heart and rely upon your faithfulness. Rely upon your love over my life. I will hold on to you and to your promises and hold on to your word knowing that your word is true. Can we hold the hands of our neighbor this morning? We're going to pray, Lord. Help me never to be ashamed of the gospel. We're going to ask the Lord to give us the strength, strength to stand as a testimony with our life. 
I'm not telling we're going to pray that all of us are going to go to the streets and preach. No, let's just live this life of Christian faith. Let's hold the hands of your neighbor. Let us pray this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you for the grace and your power to dwell inside of us. As we have studied your word, Lord, we have learned something new from your servant apostle, Paul, that I will not be ashamed of the gospel anymore. Can you say that? I will not be ashamed of the gospel anymore. Father, we know that this is the power of God dwelling in us. Power of God transforming us. Power of God operating in us. Power of God, Lord, in us. Deposited in us. Unto salvation of our own soul and unto salvation of other people who are around us, Lord. Let our lives be a testimony to you, Lord. Father, as we go out of this church today and those who are even listening to this message, wherever they are, we will make a true commitment to live the life of Christian faith. Live the life of gospel so that when we get an opportunity to share, our gospel will have the power of God in it. Lord, when we don't live worthy of the gospel, the world is not ready to listen to us, Lord. Father, this morning we want to repent and ask your forgiveness for the times we did not display Christian virtue. We ask your forgiveness and we repent this morning for not having the testimony that we needed to have in our own family. As husbands, we have failed. As fathers, we have failed. As wives, people have failed. Mothers have failed. The godly Christian duty to their own family. This morning as a church, we want to ask your forgiveness, Father. That you would cleanse us. You would purify us. Our life is the greatest testimony. Lord, Father, in our neighborhood, we have lost testimonies. We ask your forgiveness for that. In our workplace, Father, we have lost our testimony. We are never on time. We are never faithful, Lord. We are not committed. We are not among those people who they, the, the, the management can rely upon saying, this person, this brother, this sister, this man, this woman is committed. Why? Because he is a Christian. Lord, we have lost that credibility. And this morning we repent and we ask your forgiveness that we will be faithful to you. Faithful to your son, Jesus Christ. Faithful to the Holy Spirit and be faithful to your word. Thank you for your word this morning, Lord. Even though we're taking it bit by bit this morning, we know the power of God's word is working in us unto salvation. Let this power of salvation work in all of us who are standing in this place. That there will be a transformation in our life, Lord. Christ will be revealed in our speech. Christ will be revealed in our, in our actions, in our life, in our decisions. In the way we live, the way we spend money, the way we earn money, the way we live, the way we do things, let Christ be revealed the hope of eternal glory. Father, this morning, we want to submit and surrender as a church and we want to confess that we are not ashamed of the gospel. And we also confess that this gospel is a power of God unto salvation. To the Jews first, and then to us who are Gentiles. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.